Hi there. It's the Lean Into Art Cast, the show where a couple of visual storytellers get together, take a walk around a topic, poke at the topic. What kind of topic? Visual storytelling topics, because we think hard about visual storytelling. So you will too. My name is Jersey Droz, cartoonist and teaching artist. The other fella is. Uh, hi, I'm Rob Stenzinger. I'm a uh, coder and a, and a designer, UX and games. UX and games. Mm -hmm. What's UX? For those who are new to oh, the show. Oh, acronyms. Darn it. I just stubbed my toe on this, uh, this lazy acronym I left hanging out. Uh, <laughs> so UX stands for user experience, meaning uh, thinking of the, ex the, the, um, the constraints, abilities, and stuff about being human, human factors, and how can that inform uh, a design, particularly, particularly in the interactive world. Um, so a little more to it than that. But yeah. Service based design. Very much. Yeah, I, honestly, yes. I mean, it's very, it's a systemic design discipline thinking of uh, factors of, well, why are we doing this? So, so there's, hey, I'm creating a thing, a funding a thing. I've got goals and intention, but then I'm reaching out to this other group. They have their goals and their intention and their habits and their sort of context with, with the, that they come from. How do we connect these things in, uh, in a useful way? Comics is not unlike that. Good comics. Oh my gosh, totally agree. Yeah. Um, you can you could you could design a story so that it is more consumable on purpose or, or like easier or more difficult and or switch between both to serve your intent. Or or, and, or, and or designed different aesthetic designs, different page layout designs, different uh, word balloon configuration, font size, all geared to serve a specific audience, right? This is for very young readers. We're going to use larger text and we're going to use smaller balloons and less complex sentence structures. Uh, this one is for more uh, mature readers. So we're going to have that kind of dialogue that sort of um, uh, syncopates between caption boxes and word balloon and jumps back and forth between different uh, frames of reference in different times. Right. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. More work, uh, more stimulating, more, more engagement yeah. because there's more skill in your, in the audience and you're, creating a thing that meets that and that's why we do this thing together because there's a lot of we we notice the cross disciplines between uh, all these different things it all boils down to like communicating visually for the most part right it totally does and like it, it just that some that that endeavor you say oh i'm an illustrator or i'm a visual storyteller i'm a comic artist all of it it's like it doesn't get into the world and meet um but it probably doesn't put food on your table if it's you know just that discipline and those skills and capabilities you've built um standing alone in a vacuum you you've probably had to connect it to other things to to make it work for paying the paying the rent <laughs> paying the rent i don't know yeah <laughs> making a trade so so we do the show every week and we always pick a new topic every week um Sometimes we revisit old ones. Sometimes we see how we think about them years later because we've been doing this for a number of years. Um, and this week, um, we're going to talk about how do you know if it's good? Uh, evaluating hmm. feedback from within and from outside of oneself to figure out if the thing that you're doing, if you're, if you're good, if you're doing a good job and if the stuff you're making is any good. And I'll tell you one of the reasons why I'm thinking about this topic this week, Rob. I just finished uh the majority the principal amount of work on a book you know just ship the final mm. pages off to the publisher <laughs> Wait, the whoa, whoa. let's let's start th let's walk back to that phrase i finished the majority of the principal work <laughs> <laughs> that was very qualified wasn't it <laughs> yeah that was so it sounds like there was a ton of effort to get to this threshold yes but yet you can't call it done. Who knows, right? I mean, it was like, it, it, we'll find out when we get to the later stages of the production okay. with the designers uh, working on it and, uh, you know, putting it through the different production pipelines. If there's something wrong with some of the files or with some of the art, you know, and then I might, I may have to, and this happened in the past with different pub, uh, publishing gigs that I've worked on, you know, come back and just retouch a couple things. But the the big grind, the, the oh, I'm putting in, you know, eight to 12 hours a day on this thing is over. However, a lot of the work that Ann and I did on this book was digital. And I thought about how when a lot of my friends who work, uh, make comics on paper, 
when they finish that part of the process, they finish like the pen pencils and inks and they're sending it off to the, to the colorist or whatever, they'll often post a photograph, a photograph, a daguerreotype, a picture, <laughs> an image. Jeez. <laughs> they'll, rec they'll record a wax tube as they do. <laughs> yes. Yeah. All the, all the important. And they'll even send a telegram sometimes. Uh, but the, It'll, they'll post this picture of um, a, the big stack of Bristol board, you know, like here's 250 pages of Bristol board. And they'll say like, oh, this is like the last year and a half, this is the last two years of my life, whatever it, what my mom's being. But there's this huge physical totem sitting on this table, this this manifestation, this this physical artifact from all of that effort. And you get to sit back and, and like admire this heavy thing. And it's heavy, right? Like 250 pages of Bristol is like super heavy. So it even has like that added extra dimension of like mass and heft to it to represent the exertion that you just went through. Having done a book that was mostly produced digital, we didn't get that. <laughs> <laughs> and and I know that throughout the process of working on this book and, and other books that I've done in the past, I think when we were checking in when I was working on the Warren Commission report, um, there was a lot of stages where I was like, is it good? I don't know. I think so. I don't know. Do you know? <laughs> because <laughs> like because you're in that you're in that like hazy space where you're just it's still taking shape it's still taking form you know um so it got me thinking about like yeah there's feedback like i could i could i could complain that like yeah the publishing cycle takes so long and i don't i won't know if there's any good until the audience gets their hands on it that's external feedback and of course i got external feedback in the form of editorial input you know uh, but then also, like the, I thought of that that notion of having the work day where you exit, you come out the other end, and you're like, did I do anything today? It felt like I didn't do anything today. I know I was active, I know I was doing stuff. But I don't feel like I got much to show for today. It feels like nothing got done, right? And so then I thought, well, that's a moment when you need internal, you know, feedback, some kind of mechanism to let you know what this is all amounting to, right? Hmm. Yeah, I can, I can see that. I mean, there's some, sometimes it's a bit blurry as far as the internal and the external feedback, because as you mentioned, the, the tangibility of the stack of Bristol mm -hmm. is, uh, I mean, however high the stack is, it's physical. Physical stuff is inherently more tangible. And right. yeah, so what do you... Ah, what do you do? Because there, that that alone can cause this sort of this feedback loop of like, oh yes, I mean, I may be you know spent and questioning, and then all of a sudden, this thing I'm able to observe, it's telling me something. I get to react to it. That's mm -hmm. nice, if, as opposed to not not having that. And uh, you know, what else do you reach to? Which uh, that's uh, I'm that's that's what we're going to dig into, right? Yeah, that's what I'd like to. If okay. you're game, I I, I am. All right. Then perhaps... <laughs> Finally, I I commit. Oh, Rob just showed up with his bags of yes, everybody. And that's the yeah. sound. Yeah. Two bags of yes. Ooh. Ready? To awesome. Get <laughs> ready to get started on this one? I'm um, more ready than you can possibly know. <laughs> A little bit of maiden. Oh. All right. So where do you want to begin? Where do we begin? So there, there is this, um, the feedback loop. I th well, one way to look at that is, is you're, you're doing some kind of evaluation and, um, what, what, what causes that, what helps that process. And we could, we could think about this as sort of, um, thinking of self critique and, and start from there and, and because when we do that you may have some internal concern some voice some some doubt or what have you that is um or ambiguity even where it's mm -hmm. like this is not clear this there is no stack of bristol and i don't know um whatever it is i i'm i'm not sure where i square with what i what i've been working on so far and then at the same time, I, you, you can totally adopt tools and techniques to find that kind of insight and, and yeah, react to it. Yeah, do you, do you, do you want to do that? Do you want to talk about the tools and techniques first and then talk about like the, the, the why and the feelings 
behind the choices we make afterwards? Yeah, I think so. That okay. Sounds pretty natural. Okay, great. Well, what do you use? How do you, okay, so I, I want to think about, you could start and oscillate wherever you want to go. You don't have, this doesn't have to be mm -hmm. linear, but I want to think about like evaluating the project as a whole and evaluating the day to day. Right. So like when I like the title, how do you know if it's good? I intentionally left that ambiguous to say, like, it can mean, how do you know if today's effort was good? How do you know if the work, the project is good? Uh, there are I, one way I think of this, this recently is uh, there's a creative cycle and then I can have a feedback loop and how I relate to that cycle. And I try to work on a variety of projects that have different natural creative cycles that are related to the to, to their duration because some things are very immediate so i do like to doodle and sketch that's a very immediate thing i call that a no cycle um, effort but then i call it some some things have like a small or quick cycle and so that could be like a an hour or so or or you know just a small amount of effort and but it's definitely more than just a, a quick dash something off, get a thought out. But each of those, I could, I could ship either, right? I could, I could share that or I could just, you know, put it on a post-it and stick it on my wall or something. I can have a finished thing. But then it sort of ramps up from there. Like some things may take, you know, um, a collection of, of weeks of sessions of effort, right? Maybe that isn't like full time for the, over those weeks, but inherently based on um, I'm not going to get the satisfaction of finishing that creative cycle in without going through that duration, right? So I kind of tie that together because it's I'm caring so much about the creative cycle because that's when the thing is in a state that I can look at and whether it's physical or digital, have a chance to react to it in a way that, oh yeah, I'm at that outcome. I can, um, like, so let's see what, what else? Um, so there's small, basically, um, no cycle, small, medium, and then large cycle, large cycle could be like, well, who knows, this is going to take me a year or more. Right. I try to have very, like only one project in that bucket because inherently that's the project that's going to haunt me the worst with this, this whole problem where I'm like, did I do anything good? Did I do? And like what you were describing about the, the, uh, the, the rockets project, um, when it's, when you have something that's so much effort over a long cycle, it's super tough. Like I, I don't know, like I try to cheat it a little bit and, and make like the effort along the way somehow be, observable and gets and get feedback on but like inherently there's it's not a complete work at, until you get it all all the pages done <laughs> so right. though yeah i mean so hopefully that um like for me i need to try to not do a lot of those projects at the same time so that's step one is so uh, yeah, it's the bucketing time. and the planning. Exactly. So like for the, for my goals for a given year, I will try to, you know, put it, uh, not yeah, as little as few projects possible in the long cycle and try to put them toward the, the shorter medium. Okay. But sometimes that's a little bit wishful where it's a, a medium project is like, well, it's becoming a long cycle. Oops. So, <laughs> <laughs> okay, but let's let's talk a little bit about like one of the projects that not to name the project you're chipping mm -hmm. at right now, but um, oh, that's fine. I'm... So like first you, you so you're and I'm guessing this came from like just experience of like you know encountering that whoops moment, saying like okay, I I need to budget my time better in the future. But having been involved in long projects and it, taking on one of those big long projects now, how are you measuring the effort? on a day to day or a week to week to know that your that, that the chipping is going someplace. It's adding up to something and that you're not just spinning your wheels. I try to make sure that I have framed it with a, with the re, like some kind of reason where like, honestly, I'm, I'm working on, um, there's a, a game that has story elements in it. Right. And it's not that complex of a game, but I am learning a technology unfamiliar to me to also. So it's like, a lot of variables, right? 
So what's important is to at least capture the variables and write it down and also write the experience down to be able to look at it to say like, well, I don't feel like I got anywhere because the, the, the outcome I'm attached to and excited about is being able to say, Hey, everybody, I made this game <laughs> and I can't get to that threshold for quite some time. Um, so now it's more like, well, there are, you know, there's the big task you break down into small tasks and you try to, you know, sequence it in a way that, um, that makes sense. So managing the project with, um, let's see, with, with some kind of clarity and not just sort of, well, there's the big outcome and I'm just going to throw myself at it without trying to find small stepping stones to get there. Yeah. Uh, that's, and, and, and then hope, and even though the step noticing the stepping stones is not as satisfying as the outcome I'm really, really going for, it helps. So, um, one thing, uh, so another thing that comes to mind is the, uh, so, so for a creative cycle of like, you're going to create, you're going to make something, right? You've got uh, different sort of uh, roles or hats to wear. Uh, there was a, a few different things where I've come across this idea that, that really sits, sits well with me. I think I interpret it in my own way, but like um, I came across it in what, what was the book? A, a whack on the side of the head. Um, oh God, I cannot remember the full title of it. I'll look but it up while you talk. Yeah, but it's basically um, uh, the gentleman who wrote that book came up with like, well, hey, there are different hats to wear when you're creating, and you're going is it to Roger do... Von Oak. Yes, yes, it is. All right, um, I'll pull that up while you talk. So the the so whole thesis of this book is that, hey, there are these different modes, these different hats or focus or roles that you can you can you know operate within to make a thing and they're all great they actually all serve your process um and and help you get there like you know so be, you know, being like a hunter gatherer being sort of that being the artist and being creative and shaping things and then being sort of a critic and um editor right but then also being kind of like a um a, pro a manager and, a, and someone who's like well i'm going to ship this thing and distribute it get it out to the world that that sort of share it other hat each one of those is fine and important, but it's difficult if you're sort of jumping between them, right? And uh, in a way that, uh, like a classic is, let's say you've not done not done enough research to to know um, like what kind of clothing to draw on a character, so you're kind of spinning your wheels. Well you kind of skip the thing, right? So go back and do the research and be affected by it and then see what comes out. Um, and, or let's say you're, you're actually putting it out on the page, you're getting stuff, um, you know, drawn and rendered and sketched and whatnot, but you're like critiquing the heck out of it. Going like, well, that foot is pointed the wrong way and then whatever. And you're not letting yourself finish it before you can actually then do some, you know, adjustments and, and revising it's maybe that's a weird extreme example, a little forced, but like if you do too much critique without finishing the, the um, getting something actually output to critique, you might not ever get something out. And then of course you have to care about shipping, but if you're caring about shipping when you're still in the middle of, of making it, you know, that might get distracting. Although who knows, see Twitch, see video streams, see YouTubers. I don't know. Right. Um, <laughs> There's ways to ship and share your process where you're, um, what was it on the galaxy of recent galaxy of super adventure episode? Uh, you're, you're making, uh, you're oh, making and sharing your thing. Yeah. Was, yeah. So making, sharing your thing. And you're like selling your sawdust. Is that what you yeah, said? Yeah, that was, that was Lucy. Lucy Bellwood yeah. came, uh, uh, gave us that expression. I, I don't know where that comes from, but, it's but good. that idea yeah. of, um, the incidental pieces of stuff that you make in order to make the big thing that you're trying to ship they themselves can become pieces that are marketable materials, right? Um, either by sharing your process along the way or by packaging them up into something else, right? So here's all, I've got a whole, like, a whole sketchbook of research sketches that I did for this project, say, right? Hmm. Um, well, this is a sketchbook. I can scan all these pages and turn it into, you know, here's Jersey Joe's sketchbook reproduced for you to mm -hmm. enjoy, right? 
Totally. Whereas you could find a disharmonious way to engage with that too. So this this isn't like all cut and dried and all you know, no, whatever, no. You and, know, and, a listicle and, of process here. But like you can find ways where eh, maybe that might be harmonious, but other other ways where it may be distracting. But and because either way, you're not shipping the final thing. Um, you're finding an incidental product on the way to I make. See. make so you're saying that product. like looking looking for the sawdust can be a it can be sort of a a balm against the um, un, uncomfortable feeling of I don't even know if I'm doing anything good here. Right. Absolutely, yeah, that's a that is a wonderful uh, effect or a potential good effect of um, yeah, ship finding ways to sell your sawdust or yeah. You have this in the notes, this, this term of yeah. applied research, you, you know, using yeah. the work as applied research, which we've both done. Um, and yeah. that, that like when I was working on rockets, I was sharing pieces of the process by both me and Anne along the way as a way to see like, okay, I think this is something interesting. Well, anybody else, right? Uh, I've done it with a lot of different comics projects in the past. I share little snippets of pieces of it to see what people react to. Um, yeah, totally. That that is an interesting thing to um it's not a it's a signal. It's 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 some sort of feedback. Uh sharing sharing character designs like let's say you know you you thought of a game project and uh somehow we're working on Inktober and chose to put some characters doing something in the middle of Inktober and you don't really say what they're for. But anyway, that's uh that can happen <laughs> that's that's not a hint anybody nobody should go to instagram.com slash rob stenzinger don't do that <laughs> and don't look at his inktober post because they will not give you a clue to things that he is currently cooking at all that's very yeah i know it's it's totally a mystery but or it's clearly not a mystery um I, yeah, Instagram's a really happy place, so feel free to join me there. And of course, join Jersey as well, you know. Uh, I love Instagram. Yeah, it's a, you know, and visual media. What can I, was, you do? I um, mean, as, as an aside, I was talking with some of my teenage students, and they, they were asking, are you, on, are you on Snapchat, are you on this, are you on that? And I'm like, first of all, no, 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 uh, because, you know, our, our relationship begins and ends here in the classroom. Uh, I said, but I do like Instagram. Instagram is a lot of fun. And like one of the kids said, Instagram is just for people who take like pretty selfies. I'm like, oh, is that what 15 year olds think of it? Oh, I didn't know that. Uh, but I guess it could have that reputation. But I, but I, I told him like, that's not my experience. But anyway. Um, okay. So you're kind of talking about self critique as a way to check in on how you feel about the work that's being done. And then mm. it's an exterior way to do it, like treat it as applied research and share what bits and pieces that you accomplished. Um, but I'm also thinking about there's like ephemeral parts to what we do, no matter what we're doing, there's parts that are kind of unshareable and they they also don't neatly occupy discrete chunks of time in the day. Right. Um, mm. they, they, they become more dispersed and scattered. Uh, like I can, in my ETP, I can say like, okay, well, from this hour to this hour, I worked generally speaking on this particular piece of the project. I did pencils on the project at this time. But in, interspersed in there is like other stuff like, oh, I answered three emails about A2 calf. I answered a, uh, an email about an upcoming gig. Uh, maybe I made a few more adjustments to the A2 calf website because there was a change to one of the things that's happening there. You know, these kinds of things get sprinkled. <laughs> maybe through. estimation, right? Where you're like, you're thinking about like, hey, is my plan realistic? You know, <laughs> yeah. and it's like, ooh, I'm going to Instagram this estimation. Like, <laughs> watch me, watch me add up possible hours. You know. <laughs> That would be a good album. Like I would share the album. Like here's the here's my estimation at the beginning of the week. Here here it was the middle of the week. All the X's on the things that didn't work out. And then the third one, as you slide, is just me looking really sad and tired. <laughs> uh, that actually could make a pretty good comic. <laughs> you know, my week my weekly estimation yeah. estimations. So week week by week. A, a, a journey yeah. from optimism to sadness. No, that's a, that's a dark way of putting it. Because, like, cause, you know, the, the great thing about, like, journaling and tracking, we're going to be on that again. Yes, we talk about this a lot. But, like, it gives you a better sense of that, like, every Sunday when I have my, like, uh, self-meeting with my ETP and go, okay, here's the stuff I want to get done this week, it's a lot easier to tell what's realistic, what's plausible, and what's not going to happen. Um, but Quick question. Your self-meeting? Does, yeah. th does that meeting lead to any sort of thing that helps you with the uh noticing the good in in 
the progress Absolutely. so far. That, or that, something. Okay. Yeah, you anticipated where I was going with that. So like, yeah, the, the ETP, and I know I've shared this a bunch of times, like how, how mine works. Like I got it color coded into um, all the tasks are in different categories. So like I've got a teaching category. Quick pause. Um, ETP. Acronym. Oh, thank you. Sorry. The Emergent Task Planner by David Say. And that uh, davidsay.com, I will pull it up while we talk about it. Uh, davidsay.com slash emergent task planner. There we go. Um, so if you haven't heard us talk about this, I'm surprised. <laughs> the, th the only thing we've mentioned as much as the ETP is Ryan Estrada on the show. Um, but the emergent <laughs> task planner is just, it's, it's the, the name explains it. It's it, for emergent tasks. You plan out a day but it leaves flexibility and room for things that bubble up in the day so you can fit it in. Um, but what I also use mine for is I review it week to week and I look at what the patterns are. And, and in order to detect the patterns, I color code all of my tasks by different categories. So freelance or professional illustration stuff I'm getting paid for is under green for money. Uh, my personal comics work is under purple. Um, Podcasting is under light blue, teaching is under red, and um, a 2 cap is dark blue, and personal life is pink. And so I can, and when I'm filling out the, the, the time of the day, because it has like the time it's starting at 9 o'clock, 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock, 12 o'clock, you, you know, capture what tasks you did at what hours, and I fill in those boxes, the fill in like the, the grid with um, the colors, I can do a squint test to see what tasks are taking up what and what uh what i thought it was going to take versus what it did take because i estimate at the at the top of the day okay well, we're gonna have pencils today it'll take i expect it'll take about three quarters of an hour to do this particular piece of pencils oh it took an hour and a half well i was wrong there you know um and then i review that every week and on sunday when i have my self meeting and i plan out the next week i look at the week be past and i look at what happened where the emergent stuff happened you know and uh how it all sh shook out um so yeah God, it sounds so it sounds so intense to capture everything that way, but what it does is I have even when I have that day when I'm like I don't feel like I got anything done today, I do have a record. I have a record of something, right? And that becomes at least some kind of touchstone. So like just whatever kind of way things like rescue time, um which is an app that you can use to like track your your habits online, right? Mm -hmm. Um I can pull that up while you explain it. You are you you're familiar with it, right, Rob? Yeah, it's it's been a while since I've used such an app, but it's uh, it's the idea that you you run something on your machine in the background that uh, notices the 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 kinds of apps you run, the documents you open in them, and like for instance, your web browser, the different uh, the the URLs that you visit, what's their title, and then it sort of it creates sort of a um, an automatic record of of like you at the computer for that chunk of time those parts of your day yeah and there's a lot of different apps like that um but rescue time is one of the more well-known ones mm -hmm. um <laughs> troy shadowing tracks is in the chat thinking about me look doing my self meeting and he says imagining jersey going j jonah jameson on himself or on a good day perry white yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh that, that that can be the inner dialogue sometimes Sometimes it can be intense, but but often it's 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 more of a calm discussion with myself based on years of tracking this stuff and having a good sense of it. So, but I just wanted to touch on that too. Is like there's this there's there's the the stuff we can share, and there's the 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 stuff that has some kind of manifestation, something we can see. But then there's the, the stuff we do that we can't see, right? And so when the reason I love the emergent task planner so much is when that emergent stuff happens. I can easily capture that and factor that into my evaluation of how last week went because I can say, oh, well, this is what I planned to do. I left room for emergent tasks, but this particular week, a lot more emergent tasks came in, right? Mm -hmm. um, and then, then that can bring the next question about, okay, well, is this something that is part of a, a system that's like, is this, is this like something where it's going to be chronic and it's going to keep happening or is this something I'm going to have to address or is this something where it's like once a year, this kind of like, for instance, a two calf is once a year. Yes. There's going to be a lot of emergent tasks right now as we ramp up to next week. Right. So anyway, that is, that is interesting, but either way, um, you're doing some kind of journaling. The emergent task planner happens to be this sort of hybrid of a, um, a planning, 
mechanism and a journaling mechanism. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, both are very useful and then both may or may not have shareable aspects to them because they're really a, a supporting role, a supporting I, uh, yeah, capability. I never feel the desire to share my ETP. I feel like that's way too personal. That's that's one of those off-limits areas where it's like, mm -hmm. yeah. And, and, and it may be, it may or may not be of interest to other people, but um, as far as, yeah, that's, that's a piece of, that's a, an element that I don't feel like could get passed around. Yeah, same here. When I, I typically journal in uh, a tool called uh, Day One, and I get, it's not as structured as the Emergent Task Planner. I've, um, the, the Emergent Task Planner, I will hire at times where it's like this week, I'm going to use it just for f that kind of the, the benefits you described, the really, the detailed perspective on what I expected and what actually occurred, right? Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, where I often find I, I want more of the story of the of those times and those incidental thoughts and just have them on a timeline and that's where just a journaling app is 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 pretty good and you know yeah that that meets the need for me to to get that because then when i look back on it and you have to look at me so if you're going to capture if it's worth capturing it should be worth reflecting on and so yeah i, I mean whether it's some weeks, it's it's sort of I'm really trying to piece together and think through something where it's it's like my journal is an asset for planning a project, and so I see it a lot. But other weeks, it's it's more of like well, once a week I I, I dig back through, mm. and yeah, it depends. But either way, I'm getting this. I am getting some kind of signal as far as what what I'm doing. I may not, may or may, I don't often have the, the, is it good though, mm. from, from the journal itself. Right. Right. So like that, that for me, the journaling figures into the, it's, it's an artifact of effort for daily effort for me. Right. So like my, my ETP serves as like, it, it's a record. It's, it's the pile of pages to show that, no, you did stuff this week. And mm -hmm. maybe the chipping didn't amount to a big chunk of effort removed from your path, but you have record of it. So like if that, that, that ambiguous feeling of like, did I do stuff? Anyway, that's, that's where that, that it does. That, it's great about that. That's, yes. I mean, so having capturing something about your week and being able to look back at it, whether it's on paper or digital or wherever, uh, that is a great asset to, to face ambiguity. Yeah. So, so when, when the whole, is it good is more like just a, a, a flavor of, of self doubt. <laughs> yeah. Um, and one, one, this last one I want to pick at before we do dive into the next section, um, is, is one that I'm really, really bad at. And that is triangulating with peers, mm. right? So like, there's an understanding even with published projects that like, I'm going to show this to some trusted buddies for some, um, reactions to things. And like, I sat on rockets for a long time before I shared it with anybody like Ann and I were like the only eyes on well Ann and I and our editor were the only people who had their eyes on the thing at all until finally like a few trusted friends were like I'm happy to take a look at it if you want and I was like oh I don't want to ask that of you that's a lot of time that's a lot of time and, I don't, and then once I did and it was like oh yeah yeah they gave me very very awesome notes that helped make the project a lot better um and, and, and like I remember um in every case after I did that whole like squirming in my chair, like, ah, I hate asking people to spend time on this thing for me. Uh, every one of them was like, it's a pleasure. <laughs> 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 it, it's really fun to read. So why don't you let me read it? So, <laughs> uh, that is pretty awesome. So like if you're, if you're working, so peers can be a great place to get some critique from, but I mean, if you're, if you happen to be, to be working on a team, actually purposefully setting up a, a, crit, uh, a critical exploration kind of session where, um, you know, if, if you can, if you, you can get that kind of trust and openness and set, set a good tone, what, what have you, and then just go through, this happens a lot with, with, uh, you know, sharing sort of a blueprint for some interactive experience, right. Um, um, or prototypes and whatnot where getting like, okay, here's the thing. 
get initial reactions and then, well, here's the rationale for the thing. Now evaluate it. Like, do you see how could this accomplish the tasks that we set forth? And so it's not the kind of feedback you get from actually watching it perform in the real world. So like a usability test, when you put something out that's interactive, being able to watch someone um, accomplish the tasks and uh, navigate to them and whatnot, like that's really powerful and uh, indifferent because it's actually really being used. So that's, act that's um, another one to really flag and note is get your thing you made in someone's hands that you can see using it, right? Yeah. Because you may notice, and so honestly, everything that people can interact with can have usability concerns. Like your, you know, comic pages may have a reading flow issue that you wouldn't get to see unless you saw someone's eye, eyebrows go, you know, uh, crunch and then, mm -hmm. you know, and then retrace what they were doing or, or start pointing at the page and try to figure things out. And then you could ask them, hey, what are you thinking right now? And you know what I mean? And, and try not to lead them, whatever, but you're getting great, you know, evidence that's observational, right? With peers, it's more like people are going to have their sort of, um, their, their approach to critique and maybe their own rules of thumb and preferences or styles, but that's all great. That's fair game. And that can be explored, right? So I don't know. Do you find it ever hard to hear those kind of reactions, Jersey? When, no, when no, because, are, okay. I, well, I mean, it's, I think years of doing this has trained me to understand that when I get that feedback, I know it's coming from a point of view. And sometimes I want that point of view because it is parallel to mine. I want to, like, I'm doing it as sort of like a sound check. Does this resonate? If it resonates yeah. with you, then I know I'm hitting the right target. Uh, other times it's like, okay, I want a conflicting point of view because I want to make sure that this is going to speak to a broad, broad audience or the broader than what I may be approaching. Um, or they may give me a point or a critique where it's like, oh, you never use this color for this kind of sound design, at which point I'll go like, agree to disagree. <laughs> <laughs> but I appreciate you, t you sharing that with me, you know, um, it, it, it's, it's easy for me to, un to, to separate the message from the messenger, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, and so I can, I can take it all um, and, and sift through for the useful stuff, right? That's, that's great. And, and I've, I have found, um, and I'm, I mean, practicing this over time, it, uh, I, I find this less and less, but then it, it can get uncomfortable when, um, you know, sometimes getting feedback that isn't what you expected or hoped, then, uh, it's, it's a good chance to then um, explore and, and start, you know, try to find out why and un, uh, un, unpack, like, what is beneath Yes, this. I know what you're talking about. Yes, there are points when you get feedback where it's like, oh, I thought I was making something of tremendous value. But somebody has pointed out that there is this audience who is being utterly overlooked and neglected by the approach you took. And then after you have your initial feelings of guilt, shame, and doubt, and, and, and looking in the mirror saying, you don't deserve to be a cartoonist or whatever job title that you have, then you sit down and you go, okay, well, now it's time for me to do some listening. It's time for me to do some mm -hmm. thinking, putting myself in somebody else's place, time to start doing some persona work, start to look at the world through somebody else's eyes and see what they're seeing, and then evaluating, can the work be altered in order to better serve that audience? Um, mm -hmm. Yes. That is exceedingly uncomfortable, but um, man, it's also part of the it's part of the gig and it's part of the creative journey. It's like how you make something better, right? It is, and somehow the like what we're talking about too just reminded me of um, well, okay, the comfort in you know dealing with the feedback and and trying to get it so it does affect you even if it's difficult. Uh, one thing that we're also pointing out is it reminds me of um, like well once upon a time learning math in school, right? Different topics. I wasn't great at showing my work. So and this is a little bit of the whole show your work kind of thing that like doing that, that extra layer. It's not just solving a problem and getting something out, but having that, those other things are, um, that's, they, they have a lot of positive side effects and in, including you know, the unboxing of others critique and that's more stuff to capture. So 
I'm wondering though, if we're, if we're ready to examine yeah. the whole, like a little bit more about the why saying like, well, feedback sounds nice and, and whatnot, but it might be. Let's both do that uh, in about a minute and 30 seconds. How about that? That sounds excellent. All right. So in about a minute and 30 seconds, we're going to jump into the second part of the show where we talk a little bit about the feelings and the why uh, of all of this, uh, these different tools and techniques of um, evaluating whether something is good. Um, but before we do that, we got to thank some people who make the show possible. And those people happen to be the people who support us on Patreon, patreon.com slash lean into art. And what is Patreon? If you haven't heard of it, uh, it's like a Kickstarter, but for ongoing projects, that's the simple way to think about it. So you can pledge, you pledge an amount instead of it being a one-time thing. It's for an ongoing thing. It's a monthly amount. And it's your way of saying, we believe in the, the work that these guys are doing and we want it to keep on going. And we want to thank five people who have been doing just that. Uh, first up, I want to thank Mike White, and Mike White does a comic. You can find it at f at f e follies on Instagram. Uh, next up, I want to thank Owen Jolens. Owen Jolens has been supporting us virtually since we started having a Patreon. We thank you so much, Owen. Uh, been on the show before too, friend of the show. Uh, you can find Owen at Comic Colorist. C o m i c c o l o r i s t on Twitter. Also, Becca Hilburn who recently we were talking about her book, Seven Inch Cara on here. Uh, you can find Becca at, at Natto Soup on Twitter. Also, you can meet her at the Ann Arbor Comic Arts Festival next week in Ann Arbor, Michigan. Uh, Rachel Ross, Rachel, longtime friend of the show, at NYC Terrace, T-E-R-I-S on Twitter. And finally, India at Old Swifty on Twitter. Thank you so much. We really appreciate it. And uh, if you want to check our work out at patreon.com slash lean into art, you will find the shows that we produce week to week there, but also the extra leans we do once a month, which is for patrons only. And we do a little prompt there for people to do a little, um, have a discussion thread, which is behind the paywall. So it's a safe place where you can interact with the people who, you know, uh, like to think about the stuff that we like to think about. And we thank everybody who has supported us at patreon.com slash lean into art. Yeah, thank you very much. All Super right. Encouraging. Speaking of feedback. That, <clears throat> that's a big one that we neglected. Is Are, are you getting paid to do it? <laughs> I do. I have a bullet point on here. I, I, I say getting. I yeah, okay. There you go. We, we, we always have more. This is one thing where we're, our estimation is constantly shifting. It's like, how much can we really fit in the show? Oh, ah. totally. Yeah, exactly. All right, so here's the transition music to the next one. Let's talk about dark feelings. Oh, that was, that was that Pyogenesis, was... German band. If you haven't listened to them, Rob, I need to send you a few tracks because uh, I think you would dig them. You totally sold. Yeah. All right. I... All right. So, um, why? Why do we need feedback so much? Are we just a bunch of uh, crybabies? I'm going to suck it up, you millennial. Uh, we, didn't ha we didn't have feedback in my day, and we liked it. <laughs> well, and or, you know, are we, you know, priv privileged white males? We're just like oh. floating on our uh, mediocrity, thinking we, we're great, and we need that reinforcement, right? Sometimes. Some folk may say um, that, uh, I, I mean, there's, what I find I'm just going to, I'm going to put a, I'm going to hang a lampshade on the idea behind what we just like, what we just did. Okay. I think sometimes it's uncomfortable to talk about feelings. It's uncomfortable to talk about the why behind this stuff. It's uncomfortable to, to, um, be okay with, um, people having emotional pain. Right. And that's in a way underlying this where it's like, I have some, dissonance, some sadness, some frustration, some stress, some negativity about this feedback loop that I'm not getting, or I am getting from myself and I'm telling me that I'm not good at this or something, right? That I'm not enough. And, you know, yet, right? So there's that emotional aspect too, but like we were you know, more emphasizing like, how do you, how do you go to the, how do you get your rational brain hired into this process and, and helping you out? Um, I don't know. I just want to hang a lampshade on the emotional side. And yeah. sometimes it's, it's, it's easy to hear. Well, a lot of voices are out there. I don't, I'm sure many folks who listen to this have shared things on the internet and probably heard people not be nice. Um, yeah. 
and uh, and some of that not be nice. The perspective in there is is implying that the emotions are you know you're lame for not for feeling like that or whatever, and you're not because we all feel that way about what we do at different times for different reasons in some way. Even if you're confident, you know, if if you're like in the dictionary for the picture of confidence and you're like, that's me, right? That great. There's still some kind of, you know, likely, you know, doubt or, you know, disharmonious thing you you go through from time to time. So anyway, just wanted to hang a lampshade on that. No, and, and uh, I appreciate that. That's yeah. actually that that's something that I think we need reminding of more often than we think we do. Um, and that's and that's really why I wanted to to address this in the first place is because uh, even though earlier we were talking about like oh well, when I get critique from people I've been at this long enough that I can separate the message from the messenger, um, that doesn't take away the fact that when I get bad news about work I'm doing, that it doesn't turn into a lot of really unpleasant feelings that that um i mean if we if, if i was going to go step back into practical zone it's like i i know that oh this is something i need to step back and let happen for a while because if i act on these feelings right now it's just going to make things worse for me you know um but they still happen right and yeah they do and we can go ahead and uh we can throw a, a, a fresh lampshade to the other side of the room on you know, so you can have the negative feedback loops and the concerns or worries or, or frustration, or you can be overconfident too sometimes, yeah. right? Where, you know, there's no way this is bad because I feel great. And, um, and I, and that can ha um, cause not taking into consideration useful information that's being shared. So that, that's, that can be a thing. And so in a way, I mean, it's a whole subcontext to, to, I guess, complete the lampshade trilogy is <laughs> to, uh, hey, like what you described, Jersey, hanging out with the emotions, yet also finding these other tools and techniques that help you navigate it, which are often just saying like, well, I have practiced a thing that lets me get other perspective and employ my, my, you know, being rational about it, right? So it's not only using my emotions. My, emotion, my emotions are incredibly useful, but yet, you know, when they work together with with these other tools that I'm 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 thinking through, um, that's that's incredibly useful. So, okay, so we're we're kind of getting at the idea of interior signals and interior feedback. Um, mm -hmm. I'm wondering what some of yours looks like, what your signals look like, and what the feedback looks like well it's it's if i'm losing like if i'm losing my way uh, and i feel like i feel like why is this um why is this happening <laughs> and i don't have an easy answer then that means i need to somehow find a way to get more perspective where i probably didn't journal a lot that week or um i didn't set up what i'm doing as an experiment right where I don't like, let's say like, for instance, dealing with, with um, like how I want to handle character animation in the game I'm working on and just sort of not breaking that down into like, um, because there's so many different tools that, that you can use and there's so many techniques, like how do I pick the right thing? In this case, it's picking, you know, picking a tool to proceed with something on a creative project. Um, and if I'm just sort of doing experiments that are too unstructured, which I did for a little bit, because I thought, oh, I'm, you know what? I'm just going to try a little bit of animation in all these tools. And I bet I'll get I'll, one of them will be obviously the right one. Turns out that didn't happen. And uh, I needed to actually structure something uh, where it's like, no, I need to put a character into this tool that looks like at least approximately like what I want to put in the game and then, you know, try to actually animate it a little bit. And then I will have a way more informed perspective. And, and that's how it, you know, so I didn't structure it in a way to help me get through it. I felt the pain of that, of, of that. And then, you know, said, Hey, wait a minute. 
Did you so, if, did you see uh, Brandon Dayton's video? Uh, one of his video essays. It was one of his latest ones, and it was um, what punk rock can teach you about art. Oh, uh, I have not. I need it, to keep it, up with these. It's I relatively love his videos. recent. It just it dropped on June second, and um, hmm. I tweeted about it because I was like I was so taken with. It. He, was, he was basically finding parallels between like the punk rock ethos of like just ship with what you got, and build on it later you know and it reminded me of how i am i'm continually uh, i'm repeatedly victim to the notion of editing the draft i catch myself doing all the time and it's always i think at the time it's all about efficiency and i'm protecting myself from having to do later redrafts no it's not it never does all it does is suck the joy out of the project and if i think of it more as Let's just get as mi the maximum done or the, the, the bare minimum done with what I've got here right now and just have something to show for it to get the, the, the skeletal structure of the thing in place. It always makes it easier later on. It always, and it always boosts my morale later on. Um, but it's this, it's this weird little mental trap I find myself falling into over and over and over again. I'm like, well, I'm three quarters of the way through this draft, but you know what? That first part, <laughs> don't do that. <laughs> I'm talking to myself now. I'm not telling anybody else what to do with their lives, but but yeah. Well, I mean, that's a little bit of, a little bit of the reminder of that that whack on the side of the head book of 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 you know try to try to get through the whole, you know, at least, you know, finish the draft before you invite the editor in the room. But also, like, it, yeah. but like, but knowing when, like, catching myself when I'm um like you described getting lost, where it's like, oh well. I need to figure out what the internal mechanics of this town is that Bold and Fleet are going into before I move any further with the story. You know, no, I don't. I just press on, get the plot out of the way, and then I can figure out the internal mechanics of the town. And if an interesting thing pops up that affects the plot, I can make that change. But I don't have to like plumb those depths and get that fully fleshed out before I. Maybe that maybe the comparison isn't a perfect one to one with what you're describing, well, but it reminds. I think me it's pretty. It's good. Like this is this sounds like hey, this could be better. And I should act on that right now instead yeah. of saying like, Hey, I'll take note of that and act on it later yeah. <laughs> when I've, when I've got, um, the whole picture in front of me. Yeah. Um, but what about, uh, other, other situations like, um, the, like you, you talked about it earlier, the, the, you know, you did a lot of work today. You did something, but like, it doesn't feel like you have the sense of accomplishment. Like, so yeah, yeah. I think that one's that that one is something I experienced quite a bit um, because especially when I'm, when I'm juggling jobs, you know, like if I'm, it's like, I think we talked about this in some recent episodes where like my work gets distributed over a, a bigger area in the day. So I might do a couple hours of work in the morning, go teach a class, have dinner with Anne, put in a couple more hours in the evening, you know, um, and in the, in between there, there might be some emailing going on with with whether it's with, with clients or with with uh, other organizations that I work with. So I'll, I can be doing a lot of different things, and it can it can easily become very ambiguous um, as to what actually got done that day. Right when you're changing gears that often. Um, I mean, you you have kids, right? And I'm sure any parent I've watched parents with young children, how their attention has to go, who, 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 like, it's like this, it's this laser beam that just focused absolute attention at any given time. And when it gets broken, I notice there's like this weird, peaceful refocusing that happens uh, over and over and over again. And it's, 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 <laughs> it really looks like a magic trick to me. It looks like David Copperfield just did something. He made the Statue of Liberty disappear. How, how? So... <laughs> Oh, I don't feel so. That doesn't feel like the experience that I go through, because <laughs> um, it's uh, let's see, it's that. Mm, it's part of part of how I choose and how I choose to set myself up to get things done. Inherently, it's been shaped by I need to have more flexibility in where I work, how I work, and um the duration and like so many things yeah it's it i i've you know how how i approach it i'm sure everyone's mileage varies but um but it is different it is very different 
but it's it doesn't feel as uh as confident as what you describe <laughs> like i have a laser mind i don't have i don't ah <laughs> oh, doesn't feel I, it feels like like a like a dirty flashlight more than a laser. <laughs> so oh. uh, anyway. i'm gonna look that one up on uh on uh what, what is it called <laughs> urban dictionary urban um, dictionary don't look up dirty flashlight. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay, but but like from my perspective, it looked like like this. It was absolute perfection. It was marvelous to watch. But, um, but so what I was getting at was like the sense of ambiguity that I encounter when I'm doing changing gears a lot, and if I if I'm not doing something to grab that when it's happening, um, that sense of ambiguity. Can easily come come up and make me feel like, ooh, maybe I'm not doing enough. Maybe I'm not doing it right. Uh, and so again, this comes back to that whole ETP thing, but also spreadsheeting. You know, like like uh, we talked recently about Gantt charts, um, but also like you know any kind of spreadsheet to if I don't have a physical thing to look at to see how the chipping is happening. Happening, um, chipping is abstract, right? When you're whittling a thing. Um, those little tiny pieces are coming off, but it's really hard to imagine how many of those little scratches are really going to have, have to take before you get to the center of the Tootsie Roll pop, as it were, right? Mm, sure. Or you, um, yeah, you, 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 you whittle out a little duck whistle. I don't know. Right. What do you whittle? But, but, what, what, yeah. what shape is it going to take and how many scratches is it going to take with that carving tool, right? May I so, amend your metaphor? So, yeah. but what if you're whittling and you, you make sure you have a little bowl or a bucket in your lap to catch the shaving? That's right. what I'm talking about. Like tr- something yeah. where there's something, and this is me, this is just my personal foible. I don't know, maybe this will be useful to anybody else, but um, there's something really satisfying about checking a thing off and watching a countdown happen or looking at like numbers appear in a spreadsheet in a, in a row and then like counting off. And like when I was doing rockets, I mean, I was checking that that spreadsheet probably two or three times a day, even though it's like nothing's really changed since then. But um, mm-hmm. it's it's sort of like giving me refreshing my perspective on what is left to help remove some of that ambiguity and to remind me that something happened today. Some, even if it was a little bit to remind me a discrete thing happened today amongst all the mm-hmm. chaos. I think I mean, how you how you your accounting approach for this can really have an, a big influence is what I'm hearing. Right. I, I have chosen to mm, i've got probably too many systems for how i approach and manage them for how i capture things how it sort of funnels into the different final you know places where i manage my stuff right i've got that but there's also the sort of the tactical working through a thing and i will use you know sometimes I'll, i'll make I'll make a little note card with check boxes. Sometimes that's that's good enough, depending on the day. And sometimes that's redundant, where I don't need that technically because I've got it all in OmniFocus. It doesn't have to be on this thing. But you know what? One by one, when I cross that out, and it feels good, they'll be like, that line is through you. And that means something, right? That thing's off the list. And then you get to see now more and more things on that note card have the line through also very, so like I find a way to make physically satisfying feedback for stuff in progress. Even if it's like find a way to move ahead better on this character animation problem. Right. Okay. So I just defined it as an experiment. Mm -hmm, I'm crossing that off the list and it feels good. Um, I also use post-it notes for that. Yeah, post-it notes are great for that too. I, there's there's an old movie, a John Wayne movie called The Quiet Man, famous movie, uh, takes mm-hmm. place in Ireland. And there's a character in there, um, Danaher, I forget what his first name is, but he does this thing in the story. Whenever, he's, whenever he uh, has a beef with somebody, he has his little crony say, break, break out me book, write down their name, strike a line through it, that for him. <laughs> Oh, that's fantastic. And I think about it every time I do that with one of those lists, like that for you, you know, uh, and, and <laughs> it is, 
oddly satisfying. Now, I also acknowledge that it's it's not. Sometimes I wonder if and I, this came up recently with me and Anne. We were out biking uh, a week or two ago, and it was getting cloudy overhead. We didn't bring raincoats, and I'm looking at my phone weather app like every half hour. You know, I'm like, is it gonna rain? Is it gonna rain? Has it been updated? And she's like, if it rains now, we're like six miles from home. It doesn't matter. You know. I'm like, well, this is my form of worrying. It's my sense, my form of like removing ambiguity from the situation. Like, well, it says that there's a 70% chance now, so I'm probably going to get rained on. Therefore, when it happens, I won't be quite so bummed out about it. You know, um, I acknowledge that it can, it can create awkward social situations, that, that, that approach, that, 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 that mindset, right? Uh, it, it totally can. And, and so you can be looking for, your feedback thing in the, and in a social situation. And, uh, yeah, it turns out writing notes almost everywhere I go that, um, <laughs> you know, we both do this and I've seen Rob do it. I've, I've had dinner with Rob and like, we'll be in the middle of talking and the pen just starts going, uh, first couple of times I was like, Oh, but like after a while, it just, it just becomes like a natural part of our conversation where it's like, Oh, I must be saying something interesting. Uh, <laughs> You never lose focus. You never look up and say, well, say that again. Uh, yeah. Well, but... yeah. But yeah, the, these these um, techniques can have uh, unintended side effects. You know, what's funny, though, is oh. I was hanging out with a friend not long ago, and he did that. He had one of those index card holders. And like while yeah. we were talking, he was capturing things. And I found it to be so endearing. It's <laughs> 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 like, like oh. that's a guy who follows up on ideas later on. Um, Joseph Coco is in the chat, and uh, he was very kind to say, uh, Jersey was loose with season two of Boulder and Fleet, and it turned out great. He's talking about uh, the black and white mm. comic that I did, um, a friendly game. He says, yeah, I know there was some advanced prep, but it seems like when you did something, it was done. Yeah, I mean, that, that, see, that's a, good, that's a good thing to bring up, one, because I want more people to know about, about Boulder and Fleet, and we're going to talk about it in a minute. But, um, but I think the takeaway there is that here I have evidence clear evidence that I can sit down and I literally wrote that story in two weeks. I sat down and said, Oh, I got two weeks till October. Well, better get it done. You know, don't focus on like noodling and making it perfect. Just get it done as best you can with the time you got. Again, that punk rock ethos that Brandon Dayton talks about in his video, which you should watch right after this one. Uh, we'll link to it in the show notes. Mm -hmm. um, but when it finished, it was pretty good. It wasn't, you know, I, I wish I would have done it in color. I wish I could have done the art digitally rather than on paper. But even doing it on paper has its own charm. So, um, but yeah. one more lampshade. So, this uh, <laughs> this is the whole thing where sometimes the narratives we remember don't really align to the current reality, right? Oh, explain. So what you're describing is like, hey, I, f I feel like I do this thing. And then Joseph pointed out really nicely that uh, here's an example of where you totally use that other approach, embraced it fully and effectively and, and, and look at that. And it's kind of funny, like I do this too, where I'm, I will tell, I, I just have this framing of, a, of like, hey, I'm not making progress. It's just, and, and then I'll, I'll, I'll pull out like a failed project from my past in my head. I'm like, oh yeah you're doing this again. And I'm like, no, I'm not. <laughs> Maybe I am. I don't know. <laughs> and like, it just, you know, yeah. putting myself on surprise trial. Uh, <laughs> and surprise trial. Yeah. And, and then honestly, I think surprise trial doesn't work that well. If you, if you're, if, if you have these nice reminders of like, you know what, you actually did try different stuff and here's how it went. So it's, uh, that that rational emotional dance do you want to close with some thoughts on like why we even want credit for the stuff we make and like what maybe dig out a little bit of this this larger idea of like making stuff and putting it out in the world and like why would you even do that if you don't want people to engage with it mm. okay I, I like this that that sounds like a a, a a fun question to close on that we can't can't you know possibly answer definitively so uh, but at the same time, I think we'll have some interesting thoughts. So let's do that one. All right. So in about a minute or two, we will get to our final thoughts for this episode. Thinking about exterior feedback we, uh, and, and like 
exploring the feelings of why it's so important to us, at least maybe from our perspectives and maybe hypothesize a little bit on what we think is going on. Uh, not, not acting as psychologists. We are not psychologists, but we can, we can speculate a little bit based on our own experiences. But before we do that, we got to thank some more people who make this show possible. Those people happen to be us. And shame on me for pulling up this page of Boulder and Fleet to talk about because Joseph was just so kind to see the nice things about the um, black and white comic that I did. And here I was going back in time to like, hey, let's go to an earlier page where I spent a little bit more time on the page. Um, <laughs> yeah, I do a comic called Boulder and Fleet at boulderandfleet.com, Boulder and Fleet on Instagram, Boulder and Fleet on Twitter, all over the place. Although mm, I'm thinking about not doing the posting it everywhere in the world anymore. Maybe just thinking about like one canonical place for a while. I've, I have some thoughts on this, which I was going to share on the Boulder and Fleet Patreon at, at patreon.com slash jersey. Um, been dwelling on this a lot over the past couple months. Anyway, but what is the comic about? It's about a bear and a bird. It's, it's animals in people clothes. And uh, it's my exploration of exciting action adventure stories uh, with character-driven humor and exploring the notion of pacifism. How do you be uh, an adventurer for hire and saving lives if you don't like to fight because you're going to encounter bad guys who like to fight. You can find out how I deal with those problems at boulderfleet.com. Rob, you make a game. I do. The game is called This Panda Needs You. And th here's, the, here's the situation. You you have this, this, this calm puzzle um, physics and shapes thing, right? Where you're like, you know what? stacking blocks you intuitively know what that's like right in in and this is this turns like your 3d real world experience doing stacking blocks and then you know coming and maybe dealing with the challenge of that and sometimes they fall over well you, you you apply that knowledge to help this cute little panda who shows up to already stacked up blocks that are essentially now this is the solution to a puzzle that then gets all mix, mix, mixed up by because a cloud shows up and, and blows them all over. And so the panda's there needing your help to put it back, put things right, and is there to celebrate you as you go along. It's a very mellow game. It has um, this slow ramp up in, in, in difficulty that is uh, approachable for all ages, and there's like over 50 levels. So And you can find out more about it at this-panda.com. It's available for your iPhone and your iPad. And if you are here because you like the stuff we think about rather than the stuff we make, that is perfectly legitimate, perfectly fine, because after all, this is a thing we make, this podcast. And we do more formal versions of the podcast called Workshops at leanintoart.com slash workshops, where you can find comics workshops, uh, UI workshops, UI UX. We talked about at the top of this episode. Does everybody remember what UX means? Well, you can go to leanintoart.com slash workshops to find out what it means or just rewind the episode. Um <laughs> And then if you, you know, if you've already encountered or if you've already, you know, read my comics, if you've purchased Rob's games, and by the way, give Rob's games a review if you haven't already. Um, and if you have already, you know, downloaded the workshops, what you could do is go to iTunes or whatever podcatcher you use and give the show a five-star review. Or if you're watching the video right now, giving it a thumbs up helps more people find the show. It raises our relevance in search and so on. And one, I, I want to squeeze in one more uh, ad in here, Rob. If I may. Oh, yes, please do. I accidentally hit the dumb ad. I don't want to hit the ad. I wanted to hit this. All right. Uh, A2CAF is next week, everybody. Uh, if you're going to be in the Southeast Michigan area, uh, I encourage you to next weekend, which is Father's Day weekend, which is what? The uh, 17th and 18th of mm -hmm. June. Oh, I got it right here on my screen. Um, it's at a2calf.com is information on it. Uh, let me go to the guest list. We've got a whole bunch. It's it's a free comics festival held at the Ann Arbor District Library, and this will be our ninth year of putting on the show. Um, and look, Jared Krasowska is going to be there. Raina Telgemeier is going to be there. Ben Hatke, Zach Giolongo, uh, Katie Shanahan, Tin Pham, Keen Sue and Tori Wolcott, uh, Ruth McNall mcnally Barshaw, Becca Hilburn's in here someplace. I know I've got her picture in here of Natto Soup. Uh, dot com. Uh, yeah, a lot of familiar faces, but also a lot of new faces. And it's the whole idea is it's a comics convention that's fr family friendly, where every hour there's different comics workshops going on. And I have this little nugget to drop. Have you seen this yet, Rob? Oh, yes, I have. This you, is awesome. You will get to meet, for those who are fans of the Galaxy of Super Adventure podcast, Rankin the Space Elf is real and will be at the show. Uh, as part of the award show. 
uh, we have to link again to Galaxy of Super Adventure in the notes because we did mention the specific, the recent full episode. And uh, I I would imagine, I mean, the, the promise of the appearance of these characters. So, okay, Galaxy of Super Adventure, just one quick pause. It's an amazing podcast. Go subscribe to it. And it's the, the whole premise is, is there's a group of cartoonists more or less working in a co-working space, but that happens to be on a spaceship that uh, these other wacky creatures and whatnot come in and, and interrupt them and whatnot. And it's very, it's like this whole, um, it's like, I don't know, this amazing comics are great art and story mixed with uh, Pee Wee's Playhouse and uh, <laughs> Muppet Show, right? Yeah. That's that's how Zach describes it. He always says it's like uh, Alton Brown's Good Eats meets Pee Wee's Playhouse. So it's yeah. like, the, like constructive comics discussion sandwiched around skits that are where like ponies and space elves and other weird it's, monsters it's awesome. in the ship. And you get to experience this live in no other place in the world except a two cap. So like I mean it's it's like so much awesome piled in one one place. You have to go if you're if you're anywhere near the area. And uh, yeah, yeah, it's totally free. Totally free to the public. <clears throat> so yeah, I uh, hope you guys hope to see some of you guys there. Um, if you do see me running around putting on the show with my wife Anne, uh, I'll high five you. <laughs> Super cool. All right. All right. Um, ready for final thought? Yeah, I am. All right. How about so... you? <laughs> <laughs> Why do we need this credit? Why do we need credit for the stuff that we make? Why is that so darned important to us? Um. So. Why is why is it so important that we get credit for the stuff that we make? It's it's uh, it's it's another feedback mechanism. It's another acknowledgement that that what you did touched somebody and had an effect. Um, I was reading an article a while back, and I can link to this in the show notes. What was the article about? It was a Guardian article, and uh, I'm pulling it up right now. It was oh, it was actually it was about catfishing. Um, I think I, I think it, yeah I. I I don't remember why this this came on my radar. I think it was based on um, Ryan Estrada telling a story about how he accidentally catfished somebody when he was young, and that that's another thing to go look up later. It's it's an amazing comic or story that he tells. Um, <laughs> but buried in the article was this interesting little piece that really stood out to me, um, and there was uh, Sarah Silverman was talking about some of her stand up. She talked about like a heckler in the audience who just yelled the word me, and she said like you know like the the uh, but I'll just read from the article. The guy's heckle directly equaled its heartbreaking subtext. You know, uh, Silverman, an ad avid fan of Howard Stern, went on to describe a poignant moment which she remembers from listening to his radio show. One of the many callers who turns out to be an a-hole <laughs> is about to be hung up on when, just before the line goes dead, he blurts out in a crazed, stuttering voice, I exist. Right? Mm. Um, there's something, something big about that, right? We want to know that, like, what we did here, that we put a dent in the universe somehow, right? Um, even though if you start thinking in cosmic scales, it quickly turns into nonsense. But for the here and now, you want, to, you want there to be, I, I think there's nothing wrong with wanting to know that what you did made some kind of an impact, right? Yeah, this reminds me a lot of uh, Kelly McGonigal's book, The Upside of Stress, frequently mentioned book, where um, how you frame things is, is a big um, set of points in, in, in this, in the whole book, the upside of stress, meaning in, in a way, the thesis of the book is that, um, stress in your life is maybe overly maligned. Like if you had no stress, would you have any meaning anymore? And not to say like, Oh, there's only no pain, no gain or something. It's actually more nuanced than that. And the whole idea, like one of the, ideas of putting a context on like having a difficult time with what you're working on or what have you is to say, well, um, would my life have more meaning or less if this weren't in it? Right. And then that can help be this touchstone or framing of how you look at stuff where then you're like, well, I, I get to do this. And, and that whole, um, one of the elements of that is looking at like, how is what you're doing relating to helping you be part of something bigger? 
and, and that frame is a way to connect to that. And then that's, that's about, uh, well, doing something meaningful. So yeah. if, if all that you do doesn't have any kind of resonance and whatnot or, or not the, not the kind you expected or what have you, uh, um, I think you're the, the why you may be seeking it or, or being annoyed that it's not somehow aligning with what you expected um, might be because, you know, we, I think a lot of it, we want to be a part of something, you know, bigger than just ourselves. So our work gets accepted into the genre that we wished it would be accepted into. Our work is acknowledged by um, people that we respect. Um, it's reacted to in the greater world or whatever, something. Also, also, I think both of us have this affliction where we're addicted to learning. And a really crucial way to learn is to get feedback, positive and negative, you know? Mm -hmm. um, I recently had an experience where uh, I had some very, uh, I won't say like very negative feedback, but it was feedback that was dissonant with what I was trying to accomplish. And I fortunately had a chance to perform the same task again, like within like a week period, uh, like a seven day period. And when I came back, I was like, okay, here I am in the same situation again. I experienced dissonance this time. I have a hypothesis as to what happened that last time. Let me try this. And then I did it and it like, made the thing more a more successful thing mm -hmm. that felt really good that felt really good and i wouldn't have had that had i not gotten that negative feedback in the first place right that's the that that little that process that progression is hmm i mean you're just you're describing that that sort of capacity we pointed at earlier in the show so Let's see, why, why do you need credit for the stuff that you make? Why, um, let's see, then somehow if you're, if you're getting the stuff where you're like, this isn't credit, this is, yuck, I didn't want this, right? This is the, I now, was now this is for, accountability. I wanted the credit. <laughs> <laughs> and, but yet yeah, that, that reaction may have this, this value where it's, it's providing this, um, you know, the ability to learn and, and adapt. So, um, it still can be, it's, it's funny, like even that feedback that you might put in a bucket of negative still may be of, of use to you and your, what you're making. So, yeah. and why you need it. Um, I think that implies, you know, something pointing to like, you want to, um, I guess, feel confident that you, what you're, what the work that you're doing is of of a good quality and and um using the capabilities you've you've studied and built yeah again we're talking and about to, like to good two, to good effect i feel like there's two different things we're talking about here and like it's like the 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 value it has for the the ongoing life of the work mm -hmm. and and the kind of work you do and then there's just like the the essential validation of the work that you've done has been well received or received by the people that you hoped it would be mm. or received in a way that you had hoped for even if it was by people that you didn't expect and you may you say, and and getting there is maybe not one step <laughs> <laughs> it may take a few different steps and missteps at the same time which and and getting you know building the capacity to to notice it to hunt for it and all that stuff i mean there there you go that's I, I, that's our I, I was talking about this with some of my teen students and i was saying how i was pointing at this very thing like it's a long and recurring cycle of um re or iteration and they said yeah i know what you're talking about there's this one person who became a, a big star on deviantart and it took him like two years <laughs> 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 like bless your perspective <laughs> oh yeah <clears throat> So I, I guess everyone's mileage may vary, <laughs> but uh, so right. okay. So well, did we? Think? I think I think you know that's that's as good as we can get with that with a topic that big for a final thought. Mm -hmm. Um, 
I gave you a Zen cone at the end. You know, we said more than moo, so we can move on. All right. Uh, thanks, everybody, for downloading, listening, watching. Uh, this show is recorded every week uh, on YouTube. Ah, we have a new live link now, leanintoart.com slash live. It now will take you to where the live streams are happening every Thursday at 10 p.m. Eastern Standard Time or Eastern Daylight Time, whichever version we're on right now. I'm going to be gone for the next two weeks. Rob is going to be flying solo in the next episode, or will he? Because Rob will find, I'm sure. Actually, you have the next guest lined up, don't you? Uh, let's see. Or Ye mostly, yes. Mostly, yes. To be, to be announced. Okay. Yeah. So. TBA. Yeah. Pretty sure we've got the guests lined up, but you know, TBA to to be announced, and um, it's we're we're totally gonna miss you, Jersey. But at the same time, you've got big adventures going on, and and it'll be cool to connect with you when you come back. Yep. Uh, yeah. Next week is a two calf, and then after that, I'm going on a road trip with um, Zach and Ben and my wife Anne. We're going to the Cartoon Museum in Columbus. And uh, we're going to be taking rank in the space elf on some many video adventures while we're gone. Uh, <laughs> that sounds pretty worthwhile. Yeah. So, so you watch our Instagram feeds. Mm -hmm. I'm sure there'll be lots of things popping up in there. Um, and we're going to test drive some different ideas for the Galaxy Super Adventure show. So, um, but yeah, it'll be it'll be a good time. Uh, but yes, I will miss you guys too. And uh, and thank you, Rob, for taking over the show while I'm away. Not a problem. And I will, uh, yeah, look forward to your return in three weeks. Oh my goodness, yeah. Okay, well, until then, everybody, uh, I've been Jersey Drozd of leanintoart.com and Jersey on Twitter. And I have been Rob Stenzinger of leanintoart.com and Rob Stenzinger on Twitter. Okay, bye. Show notes for this episode can be found at leanintoart.com. You can also follow us on Twitter at the user Lean Into Art, and you can reach us via email at leanintoart at gmail.com. And remember, leaners aren't wieners. Thanks for listening. Okay, I'm going to kill the stream. Thanks, everybody. Yeah, thank you.